Talk Show. Recorded live. Hey, hello, everybody. Hi, Rod. Yeah. Hi, Rod. We had a we had a good week. We got a little bit of a disappointment. I was hoping to get into court, but uh, I can understand why they do not want me in court after what I did did with them in there and on the twenty first. They couldn't afford to have me come in against this attorney general because he could not explain anything. But we, with a little more information, we're going to get into tonight. And I sent him off what I wanted for a declaratory judgment. And what I explained in this declaratory judgment to him and what, what a declaratory judgment is, is number one, he has to fix the error and any contract violations done by the administration. That's number one. He has to fix it. You are unmuted. Number two, he also has to turn around and give restitution for damages and injuries on my side of this fence. And by asking for a declaratory judgment, when he asked me, what would you want, he put this thing in a position not understanding that I understood a judgment requires him to bring the state into compliance with federal statutes, with public law, and with trust law. And he was down on me having this kind of knowledge. I think that's one reason why he didn't want me in court. He got a chance to explain this. The prosecutor could never rebut it because the prosecutor don't even know about this. Hey, are we recording right now? Beg your pardon? Are we recording right now? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Let me uh, go ahead and get out. We'll go ahead and get things fired up. Uh, I think Carl's running a little late here tonight. There is uh, a lady named Paula up in, I believe it's Maine, that's going to come in and give us a five minute update on what they're doing in Maine. I'm here, uh, Rod. Okay, just give me a minute. Let me get things blocked out. Hit your, your star eight. So when I get ready for it, I'll call you in. We're going to go ahead and get the updates done, and then I'll go ahead and we'll bring you in. Hit, hit my start. There we go. And Rudy. And there's Jeanette. Uh, Rod, I think the lady from Maine asked, asked what she was supposed to push, and it's star eight, if yeah, you can it, hear me. It's your star eight, Paula. There's somebody in there with a TV going, too, so let's hope they don't come back in with that, Rod. All right, well, i got everybody muted out. All right, Harvey, updates. Uh, uh, hi, Rod. Hi. Hey, it was predicted that that case would probably not come off on May the 9th. Well, the judge put it off to the side for right now uh, because he, from what I talked to the clerk of courts, because I called the clerk of courts on Friday, I said, look, I said, I've got to make a three and a half hour drive. I need to know about court Monday. She said, you're 11 CB 1559. I said, yep, that's me. And she said, the judge decided not to hold your case on Monday because he got enough information from you on the 21st that he can sit down and, and make a ruling on this, but he needs 90 days. as He has 90 days before he has to come back with anything. I said, and she sat down and said, you realize you had a whole lot of people call here about your court date? I said, yeah. <laughs> I think that was part, also part of the reason why they did not want to have a court hearing because there have been too many witnesses to the debate in this thing, and the attorney general would not have been able to rebut any of my comments or any of my facts and conclusions and laws. I think that's one reason why they decided not to have a hearing. Yeah, that sounds like it. Uh, now, when the clerk said that the judge can now make a decision – is this a decision to hold the governor and the attorney general to have to correct or a decision to move forward to hear 
your arguments or their defense? No, what this is is a declaratory judgment basically comes in where you and I would have to plead guilty, not guilty, or no contest. A declaratory judgment on the state side is basically they're pleading no contest and they're allowing the judge to make the decision on this thing. But what decision? What decision? Okay, he has to make a ruling on all these laws that I put before him on a driver's license issue. Oh, as to whether or not they conform to the state constitution? And the federal? Well, not only that, Rod, if, and again, if he doesn't make a ruling, you can, you know, in your behalf or the way that you want this to go, you can start this appeal process all over again, can't you? Well, I can do a Title 42. But what this thing is, Harvey, is this. Uh, the Attorney General on the 21st of last month, he had the opportunity in court to turn around and rebut all of my federal and state statutes dealing with the driver's license issue. Uh, in the hearing on the 21st of April? Yes, he had that opportunity. Okay. He asked for a dismissal. Right. All right. He asked for the dismissal. All right. His argument for the dismissal had not one thing to do with the laws of driving on a federal or state statute, statutory side. Right. What was his argument? What, what did he want dismissed? He wanted to dismiss on the basis that these were not public officials but private contractors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He picked the wrong argument, didn't he? Yes, he did. He picked a, he picked the wrong argument to go into this courtroom with. Yeah. He left this judge with no avenue to sit back and, and bring forth any issues. And all of his paperwork that that the attorney general put in, all of the paperwork that the city law director put in, dealt with the fact that they were non-public officials. Right. There was not one single document that says Mr. Class was in error on Title 49 USC code on this here section that he misinterpreted it or he did not read it right or in North Carolina general statutes on drivers that Mr. Class should have read it this way. That's not what they did. They come back and say, oh, well, we're not public officials. We're private contractors. This court don't have jurisdiction. That was their whole argument. Yeah, it was kind of a kind of a hollow argument, wasn't it? And because we ran this thing through DOT to start with, and I tried to to settle this before we took it to court, and that's when they got belligerent with me, and that's when they set me up. So I took them into court because I got a ticket. We took them into the administrative side. Therefore, we addressed administrative laws, and the administrative law judge come back and ruled that these were private entities, non-public officials. And Judge May said, if you don't like my ruling, take me to judicial review. So I took him up on his offer. Yeah, yeah. I took him to judicial review. So when we got in there, Judge Manning sit here and asked the, the Attorney General, why are you in my courtroom? And the Attorney General could not answer him other than on the basis that these were non-public officials. These were private contractors. That was his argument. And the court did not have jurisdiction over private contractors because they was not administrative. And the judge came back in and corrected him by reminding him that these were agencies and departments under the executive branch of government, and these are administrative agencies, these are public officials, therefore the court has jurisdiction over this issue, and because they did not rebut any of my laws or any of my facts and conclusions in laws or any of my congressional acts, this judge now has to make a ruling based on the laws and the congressional acts put before him and the Supreme Court rulings put before him. 
Now, for those of you who doesn't understand the difference between statutory laws and, and congressional acts, we brought the bankruptcy into this. The bankruptcy was through a congressional act, through public law. What a lot of you do not understand is whenever we're dealing with the statutory side of this, we are not required to have any tags, any identification, any licenses, or anything on our side of the fence under statutory law, which would put us under gold and silver income, okay? Understand there's a difference. Under the bankruptcy clause, and we're going to get into this tonight because you people really, really need to get a grasp on this thing. But under the bankruptcy clause on this, under H.R. 1491 and H.R. 4960, which is Public Law 148 Stat and Public Law 73-1040 Stat 411, Trading with the Enemy, under these two public acts of Congress, you are required by the state of emergency, you are required to have a license, a tag, a registration for your vehicle for the sole purpose of the state to be able to securitize and monetize your property in order for them to have revenue for them to work off of to pay off the public debt. But we got them in a bind. They're not paying off the public debt. They're pocketing the money that they're swindling off of your name, off of your property. Therefore, by me coming in and telling this judge that part of my remedy is that my political subdivision was not getting their share of the federal funding program <laughs> under Title 23 CFR Section 1250, I just threw the hooks right into the system because now we're showing uh, under the bankruptcy clause where they have the right to securitize, under the securization, they also are responsible for the public debt. And this means with them owning your vehicle and owning your property, having the title to it, but not the registration, it still belongs to you, but they have the ability to securitize on it. They now have to give you that prepaid account in the same manner as if you were actually driving a state vehicle. If you actually had a vehicle that actually belonged to your city or to your state or to the federal government, these FBI agents and these police officers and, and the State Department of Transportation, these guys do not pay for gas out of their pocket. They got a state credit card. They take it down, they put it on a card. They take it down to the maintenance building. It gets fixed at the state's expense. We have that same ability if they're going to run us under the bankruptcy clause and they're going to make us register our vehicles to the state. They're now state property. They now have to maintain them. That includes insurance. This is why this is, why this is hilarious. And you people, well, Rod, I don't want, I don't want. I understand what you don't want. The problem of it is because of the bankruptcy, you have to comply and give the state the ability to securitize in order to pay its bills, and we got them in embezzling. Yeah. Got to love it. Oh, yeah, you got to love it. You, you got to love the sense of humor in this. So are you saying, now, Rod, are you essentially saying that after 90 days or thereabouts, which is when he will make his decision, that he will be he will be recommending 
corrections to the way the state is currently using the laws. Is that correct? That's what he's supposed to be doing. Now, is he actually going to go do this? I don't know. Yeah, right. That's what he's supposed to do. Yeah, that's a question. That's a question. So this may have to go yet another step, but who knows? It's already got a, It's already acting as a fly in the ointment anyway, which is great. But because we ran him through the administrative side and we pulled this into a judicial review, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, a judicial review. Pretty damn serious. It is, is, is a hearing on administrative procedures of the law that the way it is written and how they have to interpret it. And how they have to act to it. Yes. This is not your standard court that you people are used to. This is a whole, whole different ball game that they now have to go back into the laws. And because the attorney general brought up that I had to follow federal statutes and I had to follow state statutes, he set the standard to how this judge is to rule in this decision. Yeah, he, he has inadvertently made the judge now going to be his boss. Yes, he did. Yes. And by doing that, by having to come back in with federal guideline compliance, this now means whatever decision that this judge makes on the federal decisions of this not only affects North Carolina, it affects the other 49 states. Yep, and that's very important and very uh, 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 groundbreaking, et cetera, et cetera. All right, well, listen, let, let me just give out the, uh, the Master Rod Class website. It's rodclassteam.com, rodclassteam, all one word, dot com. For those of you that don't like to go on the Internet and go to websites but just like to get emails, here's how you get on the big list. Send an email to... Rod, R O D, dash class, C L A S S, dash subscribe, S U B S C R I B E, at Ray Servers, R A Y S E R V E R S dot com. That's Ray Servers dot com. A reminder, at the rodclassteam.com, the master website where you, can, where you can get everything you need to know about Rod Class, all of the blogs, all of the different people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Terry says that they now have uh, some, some new T-shirts and some new coffee mugs in the Rod Class store. If you buy something, a portion of it goes to the Rod Class uh, 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 fund to get him places, and there is one now new place, which we just got the email from Dottie today, that it looks like New Hampshire is going to move forward with their uh, uh, judicial hearing that they want to have, and that means that we need even more people to at least toss in a buck or two or three or five or ten or twenty or whatever to try to get you up to New Hampshire. Right, Rod? Yes, because they're wanting me to go up into the legislation. And, ladies and gentlemen, with this new information that we're sitting on, bring this before legislation, they're looking at trying to remove at least four judges off the bench. Yeah, yeah they want you up there in front of the legislature. Yes. They want to have a hearing, right? Yes, they do. Yeah, that's great. So anyway, if you if you can, if you've contributed before, if you've donated before, if you've gifted before, and you got an extra buck or two or three, toss it. Go to rodclassteam.com. There's an actual place where you can do it. And whatever you can do, we appreciate. And that's it for me, Rod. All right. Thanks, Harvey. Yep. Pretty. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Just want to really welcome everyone and wish you a happy Tuesday. And also, happy belated Mother's Day to all the ladies on the call. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed your day. It's a pleasure to have all of you with us this evening. 
We are very delighted, we're very happy, and we're very pleased that you have decided to take some time out of your very busy schedule. We know that this is valuable time to be with us here at AIB with Rod Class and Company. You are indeed, and as always, in for a rare treat. You're going to receive some informative information, some empowering information, and some educational information. Ladies and gentlemen, please, 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 and I always say this, please, Take advantage of the information that is offered. I tell you that this information is life-changing and life-sustaining. It is the cutting edge. Just this week in the increase.knowledge info email, there was a testimony from a lady, and I'm going to give you um, a little excerpt out of that. And she said, and I quote, I find that I utilize Rod's research at court and court findings so often, and I listen and I re-listen to the recordings, and I want to do my part to contribute to what he, meaning Rod, Carl, Jeanette, Harvey, Mack, and everyone is doing. She says, it is amazing where we are today compared to where we were just a year ago in our knowledge level. She said, I credit Rod's research team. That's all of you who contribute, whatever it is you contribute. She said, I credit Rod's research team with my increase in understanding and how to utilize it every time we're faced with court in any way. She says, I'm helping my brother with a child support situation, and I'm using it for a traffic court. So it makes it much easier for me. She said, anyway, just wanted to make sure I give back to those who work so hard and share their knowledge so freely and without asking for anything in return. So based on that, I'm here to simply say, with her testimony and with the, the, the fact that you're on the call week by week, you know that you have a powerful group of researchers, and that information is made available to everyone, and it is free. So invite others to come on the call so that they can learn also, get on that email list that Harvey's talking about, take some copious notes, Develop a study group, get to know people on the call. Those, these people, some of them have like minds and like problems and like situations, and then kind of get together and form that think tank. You do not have to do anything alone, and it is so very important that you do have help. You do have support. You do have the paperwork that's in, in the, um, on the websites and archive uh, information is there. And as always, this call is being recorded for your convenience. Like the lady said, she said, I listen and I re-listen. So it is strongly recommended that you listen to the archive calls and share those calls and that information with other people. Like Harvey said, um, go to the new website, which is the Rod Class team, and there's lots and lots of buttons and things that you can push, and they're going to give you all kinds of information. But again, I wanted to share that testimony with you because I think it was very powerful, and I thank you all very much. Hey, Rod, I've, uh, thank you, Rudy. Hey, Rod, I've got to pop back in here. I um, want to thank Paycheck Piracy for pushing out the word on the uh, court, uh, uh, he uh, on the hearing being postponed. Paycheck Piracy has a, an email list that is 10 to 20 times bigger than the big list and max list and all the other lists that we have combined. So you just hit almost critical mass over the weekend uh, because of Paycheck Piracy, cool. which, is a, 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 which is something that puts out emails on pertinent, uh, you know, constitutional law, this, that, and the other things. And so you just increased your reach over the weekend, Rod. So it's very exciting. We want to thank Paycheck Piracy for picking that thing up. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. See, the thing of it is, ladies and gentlemen, we all have to try to work together with what we're doing. This, this is not about one of us or two. It's about all of us. And what has, what has happened here is this. Because of uh, the different people out here, that have went after license plates and did it for themselves in different states, and they've proved that it can be done, okay? They set case precedent, case law. Even though their case has been thrown out, they, they, they proved that it can be. The difference between majority of the people out here 
that are trying to do this stuff, they're doing it on a very small, minute, me type number. On the other hand, I'm trying to run this thing out for everybody because the laws are there. We're all being hammered because technically, technically under the statutory law that they're running you and I under, you are being forced to break the law in order to be able to get out here and move around. They're forcing you to break it. You don't have a choice because if you don't break the law, they're not going to allow you to move around. So when you do break the law, now they bring you into a commerce side of this thing because now, oh, well, you're in commerce now. Well, I'm only in commerce because I'm under threat and duress. If I don't break the law, you're going to sit down and do bodily harm to me. So, you know, this is part of what we're coming in. Like I said, in one way, what we're doing here is what I don't want. You're absolutely right. On the statutory side, you don't. Under bankruptcy side, you do. But the benefit of the bankruptcy side is that now we get to expose the fact that they're embezzling money. And now the 14th Amendment Section 4 bounty kicks into this. That now they have to pay the public debt out of their personal pocket of what they've embezzled. And if they don't have enough money, that's really not my problem. That's theirs. They're going to have to cough up the money. So we got some avenues of what we're doing. And by me nailing the issue in Judge Manning's court about the 20, 23 CFR, Section 1250, 40% to the political subdivision, by me making this an issue, I sit down and put them into a bind where he now has to make the state to come in compliance with this. But we'll get into a little more on this. I'm gonna, I need to bring in Jeanette. I need to bring in Paula because she's got a little bit of information about Maine. And then we'll get on with the program. So do you want me, uh, Jeanette, you want me to bring you in or you want me to bring pa uh, Paula in first? Well, uh, um, I'm just not going to. Uh, give any updates because what we're working on right now can't be discussed on the air yet. It's premature, and I want to make sure that we have all the fish in the net before we yank any net out of the water. Okay. So just let them know we're not through yet. We're working on some things. We don't dare put it out over the air yet because you, you never want to lose the element of surprise or lose the edge. So uh, go ahead. I'm not going to say anything until the time is ripe, and when the time is ripe, we're going to pick the fruit off the poisonous tree. Okay. All right, let me bring in Paula. Hear me? Go ahead. Gotcha. Hi, Rod. Thanks. Okay. All right. There's a petition going around with 1,024 signatures right now, and it's by SAVE. That's uh, an acronym for Stop Abusive and Violent Environments. And it concerns the actions of Assistant DA Mary Kellett, who succeeded in gaining a conviction um, on a man for accusations of rape and domestic violence. The accusations were proven to be false. There's video. I posted a video at my website, dirtydecisions.com. You'll find the petition there, too. SAVE has done a lot of work on this. They have sent letters to the governor, Governor Paul LePage. That's all right there on the website. Letter to the Attorney General and asking for this, um, this case against this man. He's actually going to be retried on, Mar on May 23, but SAVE is asking for this whole case to be dismissed. The DA, or the assistant DA, Kellett, she was actually found to have committed prosecutorial misconduct. A judge found her guilty of that. But she was never uh, let go from her position. Now, there's a famous investigator, T.J. Ward. He worked on the Natalie Holloway case. And he said this about the, uh, he worked on this one as well, okay? And here's what he says. I'll read from a paragraph 
of the letter to the uh, district attorney in charge of that district in Ellsworth, Maine. It's around the Bar Harbor area. Okay, well, the letter from SAVE to the district attorney says, um, says this about that investigator, T.J. Ward, okay? T.J. Ward, a lead investigator in the Natalie Holloway case in Aruba, has investigated Ligia Filler's allegations and concluded her allegations were a fabrication and believes continued prosecution of Vladek Filler would be malicious. Okay, it's uh, one other, uh, uh, the court-appointed attorney in the case um, said it resembles a Salem witch trial. So the letters are all there on the website. I'm hoping people will go and sign the petition tonight because it's probably the last night they can do so. Tomorrow it's going to be presented to the governor, to the attorney general, and to uh, the DA apparently. There's also been a, a complaint made to the Bar Association, the overseers of the Bar, Board of Bar. All right. Also at my website, you can read about our recent uh, search warrant conducted on us. I believe it was to look for drugs, <clears throat> but they used the pretense of uh, looking for uh, firearms. You can read all about that too. It's concerning a 30-year-old charge, uh, felon charge my husband had. He didn't know he wasn't able to uh, possess guns. It stays with you forever until you get a pardon. So I'm working on that. You can read all about that. Um, this petition is excellent. You can read, you can get links to all the letters from the uh, website. And I encourage everybody to go to it, sign the petition. If you have a hard time signing it, it may be because you did not agree to the terms. I believe you got a check mark right underneath the red button where it says sign the petition there's a check mark you have to agree to the terms so uh, hopefully we'll be successful here part of the 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 thing that save is trying to do is to get the state of maine to drop no to to stop or to end no drop prosecution policies which don't take into account the wishes of the victim, you know, oftentimes a woman will cry rape or she will do something, call the police out of anger towards her spouse when sometimes it is actually her that provokes the, uh, that, that begins the attack. And then she'll say, well, I'm sorry, it's really my fault too. But then this no drop prosecution Police are not allowed to drop it. They have to continue, and it, the state continues to prosecute despite what the victim wants, as well as despite what the probable cause is sometimes. So it's a lot of good information. Um, I'm hoping to do a petition eventually in my case too. So this is good practice. I've been sending out emails to everybody to get this thing signed. And SAVE actually invited me to meet with them for breakfast tomorrow morning. However, it's too much for me to go down there. It's a seven hour drive to, to South Portland, so I can't do it. Would you hurry the fuck up and get off the goddamn phone? What? Go ahead. I didn't hear what Jeanette said except get off the goddamn. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to somebody else over here. Okay. You, you need to mute yourself out, honey, because you come across the phone. Well, I'm not. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm talking to somebody else over here. Yeah, so um, another thing I'm very excited about is uh, I'm still in contact with uh, Zena Crenshaw, local. She's involved with many groups, Popular, Oak, uh, NAFOIJA, which stands for National Forums on Judicial Accountability. She's working on getting about a dozen top legal scholars 
and she's working on putting together a symposium where they would just discuss the issues of uh, elected judges versus appointed judges and just the problems in the system, basically, how we can go about getting accountability. We need to put regular people in charge of overseeing these judges. Also excited about Bill Windsor's website and how he goes about um, explaining how he got his information before the grand jury of Fulton County, Georgia. I posted uh, a link to that, that website from mine and I, I did a little bit of editing on my website today. And If anybody has any petitions they want me to post, they can send them to me at pjm2008 at roadrunner.com. That's PJ Amazon Peter Joseph Mary. Or if you have a website, I'll post it. I'm trying to um, make Maine my focus, but I want to have you know websites. I've put the talk show call right at the top there on the right hand side of my my page, and I've got a few other talk show calls, just my favorite ones. Okay. That's it, I guess. Okay. Hey, uh, DirtyDecisions.com is your website, right? Right. DirtyDecisions.com. Also, Paul, I want to congratulate one of the towns up in Maine. I think it was Newburgh or someplace like that. The whole town council resigned yes. because the yes. citizens were sticking their noses in the town's business and the people wow. were upset about it. Right. I got a newspaper article right here in front of me from uh, several months ago, like last summer, I think it was. Newberg ex-employee to be charged. Audit details theft of nearly two hundred thousand dollars. Yep. So the there citizens was... stuck their noses in the town's business, and the in the town, I, I don't know who, who it was, but three or four resigned. They couldn't take it anymore. They didn't like yeah. the people sticking their nose in. So there you go, folks. Stick your noses in these towns. Is it this? Well, I'm anxious. Go ahead, Paula. Oh, just anxious to see if uh, the governor will uh, stand behind, you know, and will will do something about these things. He's, you know, elected by the Tea Partiers, basically. Um, he said he was for the Constitution. I actually emailed him this week regarding my husband's uh, felon charge. I'm going to try to get him to pardon my husband. It's ridiculous, something that happened 30 years ago. It was basically a bar fight. It, both men were drunk, but my husband happened to steal from the guy, so he got charged with a felon, robbery. And that just doesn't leave your record. It never affected us before because he's never applied for jobs. He's always been self-employed or employed by our corporation, you know. Okay. And so it just never came into play, but it's really um, like cruel and unusual punishment to continue to uh, harass him over stuff like that, you know. Anyway, go on. Thanks, Paula. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is what part of AIB is teaching. You have to know job description. You have to know what their job is. You have to know their procedures. You have to know what their rules and regulations are. You have to know what their guidelines are. You want to solve this problem, ladies and gentlemen, RAP tried this. RAP and some of these other groups, their concepts were right. Uh, we have to restore the public. We've got to get the republic back up and running. Ladies and gentlemen, you are that republic. You are that republic. You have to stick your nose in this. You have to get involved. Part of the problem, why we're having such a problem here is your lack of knowledge and understanding of so much of this stuff because even the people on our own side of the fence are only given partway information. They're not going deep enough. Jeanette is what she does, what I've done. 
what some of the researchers have done, we have gone in deep and hunt for information. Most of the people out here are very comfortable within a little box. They're very comfortable within that little box because this is their little piece of the pie, and, and they're very happy with it. They don't have to go any deeper. They don't have to do any more than what's in that little box. And like I've told you people for a long time, and you new listeners, I am one of these that looks up into the heavens. I see the stars. I look for the galaxies. I look for the universe. And if I can reach and see another universe, I am willing to reach out and stretch to go get this. Where a lot of the people are very happy within a very small planet, and if they got a 10 by 10 square foot box, they're tickled to death for the 10 by 10 square box. I'm not. I want to know more. I want to expand out because there's, there is a lot of information that we need to combat these people. And part of what we're going to get into tonight and what we've talked about here last night and talked tonight is we're going to get into some of the Civil War stuff. And we're going to bring it into the Trading with the Enemy Act of what we're dealing with right now today in these courts. We've discussed some of this here several months ago. We've got into the Confiscation Act of 1861. Uh, the Confiscation Act of 1861 was between the North and the South. What a lot of people did not realize, and I started going back in and doing a little more research into this, the Confiscation Act of this time period was rules of engagement, military protocol. All right. We have been taught through the Geneva Convention and some of the other stuff is all the stuff that we've ever learned in the military dealt with Japan, Germany, England when we fought England, Mexico when we fought Mexico, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda, terrorism, this kind of things. We did not and was not under the understanding that during the Civil War in this country, they created rules of engagement here in this country on how we would deal with American citizens during a time of war. The Civil War was not fought between the North and some foreign country. It wasn't fought between the South and some foreign country. We were fighting our neighbors. We were fighting our families. We were fighting friends. We were fighting strangers. We were fighting Americans. We were fighting our own people. Under the Confiscation Act, and you people really need to go back in and get in and read this, everything that's in the, in the Confiscation Act is rules of engagement. If you were a combatant, and this is where part of the people are coming in, I come in peace. I'm a non-combatant. I am a peaceful inhabitant. All these comments were made, but nobody bothered telling you where the links were to any of this. Again, this goes back into patriotism. It goes back into mythism, concepts, legends, theories. If you get in and you read the Confiscation Act, this thing was designed at anybody that took up arms and they fought under confiscation, they were to lose their property. Whether it was right or wrong is not the issue at this point. The point is anybody that picked up arms and fought against the United States, which was the North, which was called the United States, 
If they picked up arms, they lost their property, confiscation. Now, on the other hand, anybody who did not pick up arms, anybody that tried to remain neutral and peaceful, had the military went through and burned, ransacked, looted on these people, under the Confiscation Act, they were entitled to compensation because they were non-threatening to the military. The Confiscation Act is rules of engagement for the military. All right. We got into the Labor Code, Article 1 to Article 157. Again, the Labor Code was rules of engagement. It was rules of how they were to deal with non-combatants, how they were to deal with peaceful people. Under their regulations, if they violated and they misused their position to abuse the people, these were called belligerents, they themselves became belligerent because they were armed and they were attacking unarmed citizens. Now think about what we're sitting here saying. Civil War police officers, Civil War, federal marshals, Civil War, judges, attorneys, prosecutors, public officials. These people were put in a position that if they used their position in order to embezzle, in order to provoke hostilities, these are violation of rules of engagement. You need to go back and read the Labor, the Labor Code. All right, the Reconstruction Act, 1868. We brought this up before. The Reconstruction Act set the military in power of this country. Even though Andrew Johnson vetoed it, nevertheless, they put them in power to run the country. That's what that 1967 congressional record is talking about. We're still under military law. The 14th Amendment, when it was passed in 1868, Everybody was sitting there and said, oh, that made everybody a 14th Amendment citizen. No, it did not. It made the public offices 14th Amendment citizen. It made the state officials 14th Amendment citizens. It put them under federal regulations. It put them under federal guidelines. There was a reason for this. Right now, until, like Jeanette said, we're doing some research. Until we get some of the research done, the 14th Amendment does not, will not, cannot, ever has applied to anybody other than those who hold public office. They had to put these people under the 14th Amendment. They had to make them federal foreign citizens. They had to put them into the District of Columbia. There was a very important reason for this. Now, everybody has come up with all kinds of speculations and all kinds of theories and all kinds of concepts. But the reality of it is, like I've said, and I have told you people time and time and time again, and you knew people, go back and read Article 3, sec, or, uh, yeah, 14th Amendment, Section 3. 14th Amendment, Section 3. It tells you who is. 14th Amendment, Section 4, 
allows a bounty against these people for non-payment of public debt. That 14th Amendment bounty cannot apply to you. You're not responsible for the public debt. They are. This is another part of the thing of why you're not a 14th Amendment citizen. You cannot be held accountable for the public debt because you are the means of the income, whether it was for the gold and silver at, prior to 1933 or after 1933, your labor, your credit is supposed to be paying the public debt. Those who hold public office, these were trusted positions. Through history, prior to 1933, if you go back and check some of the, the inaugural speeches, the presidents have sat here and said that we are trustees. We are trustees of this trust. After 1933, they quit claiming that. Prior to that, they were claiming it. So the 14th Amendment has a very vital, and as we're finding out in our own time period, they will tell you one thing, they will make up a story, when in reality, they're actually doing something else because they don't want you to know. But the fact that we had the Confiscation Act, which was military protocol, the Labor Code, which is military protocol, the Reconstruction Act put the military in charge. They put them in charge. Under the 14th Amendment, this put every single public office into the federal zone. This made them foreigners. This was a very strategic move at this point in time, and not a lot of it is what we thought it was. All right, now we get into the 1933 bankruptcy into this country. Majority of you people out here have full understanding of House Joint Resolution 192. That is all you ever knew. You did not know nothing else. You were not aware of H.R. 1491. You wasn't aware of H.R. 4960. You were not aware of this. You were never told. It was never explained. You were never supposed to know and ever find out about this. Because when they did Public Law 10, which is H.R. 1491, Public Law 10, Chapter 48, 48 Stat, 112, this relinquished your gold and silver abilities in this country. They stripped you. Now, you got people that's going to come back and say, well, they repealed it. They only repealed part of it. They allowed the jewelers to have gold and silver, but you still technically cannot use gold and silver in this country. You're not supposed to be able to. That's why they gave you the Federal Reserve notes. And um, we got some information on this. We're going to get into this a little bit tonight. All right. But what you were not told, and we brought this up, is this 1491, Public Law 1, 48 Stat 1. If they would have left this by itself, and that is where they regulated licensing in this country, this is where they regulated registration. If they would have left it by itself, this would have been a different issue. But ladies and gentlemen, they did not. When you go back and read Title 12, 95B, you go back and read Statute at Large, Volume 48, pages 1 through 112. You go back and read H.R. 1491. You go back and read Public Law 1, 48 Stat 1. You will see in each and every one of these documents, they placed 
in Public Law 73-10-40, Stat 411, October 6, 1917. When they did the licensing, they brought in the Trading with the Enemy Act into it. They brought in Title 50, War and National Defense. They tied this all together. Prior to 1933, we were peaceful inhabitants. After 1933, when they forced you and I into registering, and they brought this thing under the Trading with the Enemy Act, this is where the Confiscation Act and the Labor Code comes in to full force and effect. This is protocol on military side on the public office side, or how they are to engage you and I. Under the regulations, they cannot provoke, they cannot be belligerent, they cannot create any incidents in order to securitize and monetize and profitize and pillage and plunder and loot off of you and I, because when they drag us into the court, you've always heard it said, the moment you opened up your mouth, you created the argument, so now you're being belligerent. Well, under the rules of engagement, under that military flag that sits in that courtroom, under Army Regulations 840-10, under the administrative procedure side of that flag, which falls under the state of an emergency, which falls under military regulations, the moment that police officer pulls you over on the street and you were minding your own business, the moment he pulled you, he became a belligerent. He now is armed, you are not. He holds military rank, you are a civilian. The moment they drag you into that courtroom, that is for pillaging and plundering. And when they did the 1933 bankruptcy, and they created the trust set up in this thing, because they could not get to the trust prior to this, so they had to bring you in under the bankruptcy and create the straw man. This is where they created the all caps name. This is where the you had to be signed in. The moment they sit down and they pulled you, they became a belligerent because they knew they were going to embezzle, swindle, steal, pillage, plunder, and they did it under a military flag and the judge is claiming because you argued you now are the belligerent. No, that's not the case because their rules of engagement says they can't do this. But ladies and gentlemen, this thing gets into a lot deeper, a lot, lot deeper on this. All right, the, the statute on the all caps name, this comes under Texas Administrative Code under corporation, under chapter 79, under 79.31, entities. But it's also in the style manual for capitalization. So get into the U.S. government uh, style manual. That's where part of this is at. But ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot bigger picture here than you understand and what we're doing here on addressing this, because we not only have them on the administrative side of this thing, if they want to claim administration, 
under the administration, we have to be the plaintiff in an administrative court. They want to claim that they are going to run under judicial, then we have them under the 11th Amendment. There's no judicial power. They want to claim maritime jurisdiction in these courts or admiralty's jurisdiction. We now have them under the Confiscation Act and the Labor Code and the Reconstruction Act. We have them under the Bankruptcy Clause for an argument with this. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we are coming up with more avenues to come back and fight these suckers than they ever anticipated that we'd ever come up with. And we are opening up more and more doors. But Jeanette and I are working on some other information at this point in time that once we get this down pat, because we're tying it back into the trust side of this thing, once we get this thing down pat to where we actually know when, where, and how, we're going to be able to address this a little bit more. But ladies and gentlemen, that flag in that courtroom, I don't care what this judge does, the bottom line is that flag in that courtroom comes under Army Regulations 840-10. That's the bottom line on this flag. <clears throat> He's running under administration. He's running under the bankruptcy clause. He's running under the state of emergency clause. He's running under the trust side of this thing. And because he is, we now have him on the administrative. We've got him under the 11th Amendment. And now we have him under military protocol on how they are to react in the military protocol. And I would suggest, you ladies and gentlemen, in all honesty, get in, pull up. The Reconstruction Act, it's on the websites. Pull up the Libra Code. I think we got to get it out, but you can pull up the Libra Code. You can go into Avalon and get it. Pull up the Reconstruction Act. That Reconstruction Act forced these state officials, not you, state officials. It forced the state officials into a federal spending into the fact of foreign standing. The 14th Amendment put him there deliberately. Not you, not me. Them. We got somebody playing with the phone. That, let me just see who, that may be Jeanette. Jeanette, you have a problem with your phone, honey? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, no. Um. I was I've been muted out, but I've been trying to bring in I have the Libra code in my hand. Okay. It's a hundred it's hundred and fifty seven articles. Let me just read one section. Okay, section two. Public and private property of the enemy. You guys you're all gonna fall out of your chairs when you hear this. Okay? Public and private property of the enemy. Protection of persons and especially of women of religion, the arts and sciences, punishment of crimes against the inhabitants of hostile countries. Remember, this was written when, Rod? This was during the Civil War. Right, 1863, the same year as the Bank Act. Okay? Now, I'm just going to read this one paragraph. This is Article 31 out of 157. A victorious army appropriates all, all public money seizes all public movable property until further direction by its government and sequesters for its own benefit or of that or of that of its government all the revenues of real property belonging to the hostile government or nation. The title to such real property remains in abeyance during military occupation and until the conquest is made complete. Folks, this was written in the 1800s. Now, who do you think that they were referring to? Who kind of explain to them what Abraham Lincoln was doing, Rod? Abraham Lincoln at that time, he was dealing with the banks at that time. Remember Jeanette brought up about the Roth what, Rockefellers? The Rothschild letter of, the the Rothschild letter of eighteen sixty three, where they were gonna bring the banks in and print the greenback the banknotes to look so close to the greenback, no one will understand the inimical harm it will cause but bear the brunt of the burden, meaning 
We're going to be printing banknotes. You're going to think they're greenbacks. They're really banknotes. We're going to make 90% profit off each one off of you, and you're going to carry the brunt of the burden. But the word inimical means evil. Now, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in 1865. Abraham Lincoln knew what these guys were doing. The enemy is already in this country. That is why we are all still under martial law. The enemy is the banks. It's the Federal Reserve. They were trying to come back in at that time period. That's right. Because we, we had is 1863, we have the letter from the Rothschilds that shows the means, the method, the motive, the opportunity, and the intent of what they were going to do with the international banks coming from Europe over here, starting in New York with Kuhn and Loeb. That's the beginning. Then they set up the, the Federal Reserve. Okay, They sank the Titanic that was built to be sank with everybody on it, the world's wealthiest people that were in opposition to the Federal Reserve. Abraham Lincoln knew this was coming. He put all of this in the best hands that he could. That's military. Ask yourselves why Hillary Clinton has put herself in the, the Secretary of State and or State Department, which is the highest ranking military position that she can get. She doesn't know uh, Shinola about military strategy. All she wants is to get in through the military hole to pierce the trust, to get the trust. All right. I think you're going a little bit too far. Thank you. Yep. But we're under the thing. You need to get in. You need to read the Complication Act and the Labor Code. Ladies and gentlemen, these are rules of engagement. This applies to what we're dealing with under the state of emergency. This is what it deals with under the bankruptcy clause. They cannot come in and violate rules of engagement. And that's exactly what they're doing. Part of it is we were not aware of this. We did not know what the rules were for engagement on their side. We only understood the the war war rules of engagement. We didn't realize there was a set of rules of engagement for them dealing with American citizens, American people. This is what the Civil War was. That's where that Confiscation Act comes in. That's where the Labor Code comes in. This is rules of engagement of dealing with the home people. This is what we was never aware of. This is that part of the Civil War that you were never told. This is part of the Civil War that we was never had a comprehension on because they never wanted us to get this type of knowledge to go back and do the ties between the... the the Confiscation Act, the Labor Code, the Reconstruction Act, why they passed the 14th Amendment, and why we're sitting up here under the 1933 bankruptcy, it was bad enough that they took the gold and silver off of us. But when they put us under licensing and they tied this thing into the Trading with the Enemy Act under war and national defense, they now have to comply with rules of engagement when they're dealing with you and I. As long as we are not creating a problem and they are forcing you and I to break the law so they can come back in and say, you're being belligerent because we were forced to break the law because by trying to comply with the law, the way it was written, and that's where the statutory side comes in. If we were to comply with the statutory side, we would not have a problem. But because they threw the bankruptcy into this, now trying to comply with the statutory side puts us in as being belligerent because under the bankruptcy side, we have to register ourselves in order for them to securitize and monetize, which created the trust on this puppy. And we was not aware of any of all this, but now we got them in embezzling. We now can go back and prove that they have not paid off the public debt. All we have to do is go to Washington, D.C., get on that public debt counter and see how many times that sucker has clicked around and how high that sucker is, and this is what they were supposed to have been paying off. 
and they haven't. All this comes under what we've discovered between the Confiscation Act, the Labor Code, the Reconstruction, the 14th Amendment, and the bankruptcy. These four, five, five issues, these five issues are key points of dealing with these courts along with the administrative side, along as, as well as the 11th Amendment issue. Now we have more ammunition to walk in here with, but the problem of it is you have got to be able to walk, talk, and explain this. You can't walk in here and fumble around. Because when I went into court on the 21st, they will tell you, Rudy will tell you, and the people that, that was there will tell you, I had more answers coming out and explaining, and the judge could not handle it. What is in my paperwork, what I put in my paperwork, could not be rebutted or disputed by the Attorney General's office. Otherwise, they would have come back in and they would have said, well, Mr. Klaus is wrong because under 49 stat, so-and-so and so-and-so, this is what it said here and said. They didn't do that. They didn't come in under Title 49 CFR and said, oh, well, Mr. Klaus was wrong under so-and-so and so-and-so, and here it is. They didn't do that. They didn't come in under Title 23 USC Code or CFR. They could not rebut one single statutory law or congressional act that I put in. Their only defense is that we are not public officials, we're private contractors, basically belong to a, a corporation. And the judge blew it right out the door. He did not allow that attorney general to go with the fact that they were private contractors and a corporation. Why? because we came out of one administrative court and we came into a judicial review court. And I'm telling you right now, these people are not set up to be taken into a judicial review court out of an administrative court. If you can walk, talk, and explain this, they don't have an avenue to run down because they have to dispute their own procedures, they have to dispute their own regulations, and they can't, but the moment they do, they commit a crime in that courtroom of active treason. They can't rebut or dispute. And part of what Jeanette was getting into on this Federal Reserve note is, ladies and gentlemen, if you take a dollar bill, a five, ten, don't matter, if you look at the left-hand side, that little round green seal that has a letter in it, it says Federal Reserve Note around it. If you look over on the right side, on the other side of the president, you will see a black seal, and it says United States Department of Treasury. Under title... 12, and Martin brought this up some time ago, under Title 12, under Section 411, it sits here and says, redeem and lawful money through Department of Treasury of the United States. What these people are doing is they are handing you the Federal Reserve note on the left side, and they are turning around, and they are securitizing on it, and they're taking it down to the Treasury, and they are redeeming it for lawful money. This is why our public debt is not paid off. They keep handing you and I the Federal Reserve note side of this thing, which is the debt side, while they are cashing it in on the lawful side, and they're pocketing the difference. 
This is a whole new avenue. And this is what Jeanette was sitting here saying. When they created this bill, they sit here and changed it just enough that the average citizen would not catch it, they would not find it. But by putting the, the Federal Reserve seal on one side and the Department of Treasury on the other side, they set it up to where you and I, whenever we deposit our check, it's the Federal Reserve side. They're well, Robert, around Robert, and it. Ron, yeah, go ahead. Your phone's breaking up. When the Rothschilds wrote that letter, um, it was to Sherman uh, in Ohio when they were uh, doing the um, correspondence back and forth. They actually, they, the Rothschilds, actually provided an actual numbered, detailed formula of how the profits will be reaped off of those Federal Reserve notes. They, they used a mathematical formula of exactly how much of a percentage of profit that they would make off of each one. They knew then what the formula was, and it's been in application ever since. So what you're talking about was a mathematical formula, and they know exactly what they were doing. However, I'm quite sure that the interest uh, and the proceeds have quadrupled since 1863. But they had a mathematical formula of exactly how this was to work. They knew at that time. Uh, this is part of the, the, there's a There's a big piece that's playing in this. But ladies and gentlemen, right now, you need to go back in. You need to understand. Take your time. Read the Confiscation Act of 1861. Read the Labor Code of 1863. Read the Reconstruction Act, what we put out on 1867. Go back in and start understanding the bankruptcy of that Public Law 10, Chapter 48, 48 Stat, 112, Public Law 1, 48 Stat 1, and Public Law 73-10, 40 Stat 411. Ladies and gentlemen, you go back and start reading them and you start thinking about what they have wrote in them, and you start understanding this, now you, want, you will get a different perspective on the 14th Amendment citizenship of why it's not you and I. Well, the Lieber Code, that's spelled L-I-E, B as in boy, E-R. It's the Lieber Code of April 24th, 1863. April, May, June, that's two months before the letter from the Rothschilds. Okay, the Libra Code of April 24, 1863, also known as Instructions for the Government of Armies of the United States in the Field, General Order Number 100, or Libra Instructions, signed by President Abraham Lincoln. That's the title of this. Okay, uh, go ahead. With what uh, Lucius Ewing's putting up, the 34th Congress in 1856 abolished all judicial districts within the United States. All right, he put they put everything under administrative. This is why we're, we are dealing with the fact that there is no judicial court because 1795 they passed the 11th Amendment. If they got rid of all judicial districts in 1865. This is prior to the, to the Civil War. This is prior to the Civil War. That means we're dealing with everything under administrative. If it's all administrative, then we have to be the plaintiff in these courtrooms. We can never be a defendant in an administrative court. But see, military is administration. Let me bring in, uh, I guess somebody's got, got their hand up here. Birdseed. <coughs> Go ahead, Birdseed. Hi, Ross Martin. Yeah. Hey, um, I was just going to, uh, do you realize what happened in 71, January 21st, when they took all the Treasury notes out of circulation and created the dual note called the Federal Reserve Note and Treasury Note? Okay. They They stopped printing... What happened was there was 300 million treasury notes in the vault, and nobody was redeeming the um, 
Federal Reserve notes for Treasury notes, and they had a press that was sitting by a printing press not printing anything, so they, they put it in January 21st. They uh, made the uh, Federal Reserve note a dual note. That's why they... Oh, just a minute. Just a minute. Let me find you, Birdseed. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. There we go. Anyway, on January 21st of 1971, they changed the, the um, Federal Reserve note to a dual note. They made it a Treasury note and a Federal Reserve note, depending on how you uh, claimed it. And that's why if you put uh, redeem and lawful money pursuant to 12 U.S.C. 411 on the back of a check when you cash it, now when you, when you get Federal Reserve notes from the teller, they're actually treasury notes. It's just how you request them when you when you request the note. Okay, like I said, we're, we're getting some information. Like I said, this is part of the scam, ladies and gentlemen, that they've ran. These people were required to pay off the debt, not you and I. They were required to pay it off because they have access to the money because they had access to the money, they're required to pay the bills, and they're not paying the bills. We got these people over a barrel if we could go back in and we start understanding this stuff. We have these people over a barrel on this. All right, let me uh, bring somebody else in. KMA, go ahead. KMA. Hello. KMA. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's me. Did you get my message this evening? Uh, which one? The one about uh, with as much as you brought out and with what Jeanette's brought out and, and uh, everything that we've learned so far, we could take the, the federal government and every bank, every institution, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, financial institution, we could take them all to court, sue them all, make them pay Everything that they've securitized because they've gone against the trust, they've broken, uh, they've broken their fiduciary responsibility. We could take them all in and have them pay us in, um, uh, pay us for everything that they've monetized us for. Since they didn't do what they were supposed to with it, turn it back over to us, pay us in gold and silver, give us our gold and silver back, and then we can turn around then and turn our country around that way. And and uh, and what we'd have to do though is take them to court and sue them and then seize all their assets and make it so that everybody gets paid what they've been monetized on. And uh, now, I believe that's the way we could turn it around. Well, now, we, we, we got one problem with this. Uh, okay. Number one, we have to take this to a military court, and that's what we're trying to get into. But, yeah, yeah. Please, please, please do not act prematurely. The homework is not done. If you jump on this thinking that you can go in there and just go ahead of everything, you are on your own. And wait, 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 Jeanette, wait. What I'm, what I'm, I'm bringing this up to see if, if we, if, if we're on, if that, if that would be the right track to pursue. I'm not, no. I'm not saying I'm going to go jump out here and do this. I'm no. saying that is that what we need to do? And I know that Rod knows a whole lot more about this than me, and I'm willing to follow his lead. I'm not going to try to lead. I'm yeah. following his lead. Yeah, well, somebody else may want to jump on this, and, you know, the, the homework's not done. So anybody who goes ahead and jumps on this, like I said, they're on their own because we've not finished the homework yet. And remember, Rod has already made it clear under the 11th Amendment, what do the courts have jurisdiction of? Nothing. So you don't want to go there. Rod is going to explain why this is military. The whole thing is military. It has I, understand to go I understand that. I understand that. I'm not saying that you would do this. I'm saying somebody else out there may be sitting, you know, going, oh, that sounds like a good idea. I think I'll take what information they gave me tonight. I'm going to go file a paper tomorrow. Well, we heard about the Libra Code, and you can't do this. Therefore, pay me. No, no, no. You just, you know, please, folks, just wait until we get the homework done. We're only giving you only a little bit of it because we don't have it all done yet. We will be happy to give you what we have when it's done, it's not the the omelet is not through cooking, folks. 
Don't okay, y'all, uh, y'all don't have to be the only one doing the looking, though. Here, here's, here's something that came up last night on one of the calls. Uh, a lady that I'm associated with for a few years now, uh, we were trying to get Obama out of there, or trying to keep him from being able to get in there in the first place and then get him out once he got in there. Uh, so we've been we've been together, uh, been talking together for quite a while now, but she has a personal loan with a personal lady, uh, with a, with a, with an individual. She bought a place from her, and they went through a uh, 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 what do you call it? a servicing agent, and had them uh, had had the check sent to them, and they paid the lady, and they charged a servicing fee. Now they've turned around and stole her note. Where she signed uh, all the other uh, all the other information that the other lady signed, uh, everything they signed in blue ink. Well, uh, where the other lady signed, they had all that because it was invaluable. But where she signed, getting a a, a, a loan from this lady, basically, uh, the lady did uh, did her own uh, you know uh, on her finance, and they took that note and they securitized that. They stole it because they can't find the blue ink signature where this lady signed it. Okay, now. What? Hold on, you're going off on another trail. No, what? it's all part of the same thing. That's what I'm saying. They do it even when you when you involve them, uh, just to hold your paperwork. They even illegally do it to your personal loan, and that is definitely illegal. So okay, I, you... that's what I'm saying is that uh, that they have done this to the point, and and, and that they've done it so many times they can't hide a bit of it now. Okay, take a breather. Take a breather. Take a breather. I got it. Go ahead. I'll give you a chance. Go ahead. Thank you. I, ho- I hope I'm not interrupting. The thing well, is, you are, but that's okay. Go ahead. I value your information. Okay. Now, now just take a breath. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Now, are you are you through now? Okay. <laughs> no, but go ahead. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait till you're through because we're wasting time here. The well, reason, you're the one, you're, you jumped in there on my on the middle of my conversation. I didn't jump in on the middle of yours. I do value your information, but you jumped in there in the middle of this, and and you had something to say. I let you say it, and now I was coming out with some more information here, and and we're sharing information. We're not supposed to be fighting. We're supposed to be on the same side. So, okay, I, but I, when, I, when 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 I pause for you, go ahead and talk. When you pause, I'm going to jump in there. I use this dead airspace. So go ahead. Yeah. I, I just I really don't want to interrupt you interrupting me. Okay. So here's the deal. I want to. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, no. You interrupted me, so I'm not interrupting you. So let, let's don't get around to mute us both out. Well, he'll only mute me out. He wants to right, mute you right, out. All right, both, no. both of you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Want to mute out both of you? Just shut up. Now here's the deal. The reason that they've been doing this for so long, Mr. Mega Mouth, is because. Nobody has had all of the documented evidence. That's why they've been doing this for so long. If you would get out the duct tape and listen, you would hear Rod explain to you why they've been doing it for so long and why they're going to be subject to stopping very shortly because the gig is up. Now, if you listen instead of talk, you'll hear Rod explain why you don't want to take them to court, and why they're going to be ceasing and desisting in the immediate future. Now, please, Rod, speak. Uh, What we're looking at, ladies and gentlemen, is this. With what we are going back in and re-looking at a lot of the paperwork, all this has significant value. Everything is under military jurisdiction. All of it's under military jurisdiction. The problem of it is a lot of these different groups out here, RAP and some of these other people, they were right on the aspect that we have to bring the republic back in. Where they made their errors is they wanted to bring the republic back in, but they wanted to point their own people to the republic side of this thing. You can't do that. Stop and think. What happened here in Iraq when they got Hussein out? Did they sit down and put people in? Or did the military step in and say, okay, your government is gone. We're going to keep it under control. 
you're going to hold, get a new constitution up, get your constitution formed, get your people who you want up for elections, and get your election up. That is what the military did over in Iraq. Stop and think what they did in Germany in World War II. They came in, they occupied Germany after the war, they let them get their act together, and then the military turned it over once they got their free election up. Stop and think about what RAP did. RAP sit down, they used the military, and they held their own personal election among their own people in order to put their own people in these offices when they should have had the military step in, shut the system down, get the Constitution refortified, get it built back up, have the military run it, and then we run new elections. Look what they did over in Egypt. Ladies and gentlemen, this is part of our problem. We are running we are running with a lot of unfamiliar knowledge of it is me, me, me being put into office. This is not what this is supposed to be about. The opportunity is here. We're trying to do the research on this. I was given some information. I'm going back in and reevaluating a lot of what we looked at because, ladies and gentlemen, the truth is we are under military guidelines. But we was not aware of the rules of engagement or how they were to deal with you and I. We didn't know what the rules of engagement were. Now I'm getting a better understanding, and I want you to go back in and read the Confiscation Act, 1861. Read the Libra Code. Once you start reading this, and you start understanding this, and you start understanding the bankruptcy clause that we have, all right, KMA is right. We need to take it in. But it has to go before a military tribunal. It has to go before a military court. We got to get the military involved. Now, the problem of it is, which one do we get involved at this point in time? This is something that I need to go back in and discover which department. And I, and I have pretty much an idea because I've been told which department, but I need to go back and do some research on it. Once I get this information, I'm going to run some test runs again. We still have our paperwork into the Coast Guard. We have our paperwork into the Navy. We have our paperwork into the Army. All right. Well, this paperwork has been filed. It is sitting there. I'm still waiting for a result. But there is proper protocols of what we're on how to run in this thing. And that's what I'm trying to work on. I may have went through the wrong door figuring, okay, this is the proper door, this is military, this is the proper protocol for running with military. But because we're dealing with a trust situation, this puts things into a different perspective. And I wasn't aware of this at the time. But with the new information that I've been given, and I'm looking back at RAP, I'm looking back at Tim Turner, I'm looking back at some of these other people that said, oh, we got military, we got military. And the biggest mistake that I've seen, and I've, I've seen it in every incident with them, is they tried to put their self in charge. They try to point their own people to be in charge. I think that's where they made their mistake. Had they came out to you, had they come out to the Republic and sit down and say, ladies and gentlemen, the military is willing to back us under 
the condition that we hold a free election in this country. Not me getting a grand jury or me getting assemblies up and we make the decisions for all of you. I think that's where they made their mistake. I think what we need to do is I'm trying to find the door, the proper means to go in and address them and sit down and say, okay, you want the republic stored. We want the republic stored. How do we go about doing this? It isn't up to me to pick people. You need to do what we did in Germany. We need to do what we did in Iraq. We need to do what they're doing over in the Middle East when they when the people fled. The military has to take charge. They have to run it until we get our constitution reestablished or what we what we want to run under the constitution that we have right now. All we have to do is tighten it up because it's really a good constitution the way it's written out. We just need to tighten it up. Get our free elections. Now, part of these free elections has to be based on this. Under Article 1, Section 9, Clause 10. No titles of nobility. That was already in the Constitution. We need to keep it under the organic. And the 1918 13th Amendment. No titles of nobility. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I are going to have to get educated better than what we are. We are going to have to be able to walk, talk, and explain. Our freedom is not based on us sitting back watching TV. Our freedom is based on us being knowledgeable and being able to keep our freedom. This is part of what V.K. Durham was talking about here several years ago, those who heard. Once we learn how to keep it, then the income will be there from the trust. And there she's absolutely right. We have to be able to sit down and understand what their job description is. It's like what happened in Maine, what Harvey brought up. The people got into city council, and city council did not like the citizen understanding the wrongdoing, and a few of these people quit. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what this whole thing is all about. We have to be able to go in. This goes back to that conversation that I had at the, at the Abate Motorcycle Club up in Ohio. When we had these congressmen that came in and made the statement, until you tell us to quit, why should we? Until you sit here and get in our face and make us quit, why should we? Because if you don't care, we don't care, and we're going to sit here and pillage and plunder. And ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly what they are doing. And what I proved up here in court in Raleigh, I have a very substantial kickback on this thing because this judge was put into a position, I'll guarantee you, as long as he's been on the bench, he's never had anybody come in and do what I did. And that's the same thing with our, our IRS case with Dave Bussey's in mind. The lawyer tried very, very hard again to pull me into the wrong court, and I did not fall for it. I just got my paperwork time stamped, sealed, delivered, compliment. I got it where it has been confirmed. We do have a court date in the proper court, which is administration under petition for review for administrative violations against IRS and against these other agencies that we're dealing with. They tried real hard to get me out of this court. It did not happen. I got a confirmed date on this. 
I got my paperwork timestamp of all my paperwork back saying it's confirmed, we're ready to go. The other side has already got my brief. They got 20 days to sit here to answer my brief by the time I get back because I'm going to be gone here this week. My wife and I are taking off. There will be no Friday show. There will be no Friday show. There should be a, another Tuesday show for Ghost Fighters Night. But my wife and I got to take off for a little while because she's got a birthday. And she wants to get out and celebrate her birthday. And I told her I'd take her out because I don't take her out much because of what I'm wrapped up into. With, we're trying to help you people fighting this. I don't spend much time with my wife, and I need to spend some time with her for her birthday. But ladies and gentlemen, we are opening up doors. I need you to sit down and start grasping this stuff as fast as you possibly can. Because if we want to restore this country, we're going to have to be able to restore it, and we're going to have to go through the military on this. But we have to know their protocols. Because under the Reconstruction Act and under the Lieber Code, we have these people that's sitting in public office right now, we have them dead to right under the Lieber Code for violation from Article 1 down to Article 57. We got them in violation of the Confiscation Act of 1861. We've got them dead to right on this. Hey, Rod. Yes. On the Lieber Code, read number 98. Go ahead, read it. Oh, okay. Um, oh. All unauthorized or secret communications with the enemy is considered treasonable, treasonable by the law of war. Here's, here's the important part. What have you brought up in the past about foreign states, okay? Foreign residents in an invaded or occupied territory or foreign visitors in the same can claim no immunity from this law. They may communicate with foreign parts or with the inhabitants of the hostile country so far as the military authority permits, but no further. Instant expulsion from the occupied territory would be the very least punishment for the infraction of this rule. Now, what you guys hear is not what that really says. And that's right on top of this. Rod, I know you know what that just meant. All right. Now, this is why the 14th Amendment came into play. Because the moment the 14th Amendment was passed, it made every state official a foreign subject. And remember, we addressed this under the Foreign Sovereign Immunity under Title 28, under 1602 to 1611, under the International Organization Immunities Act of 1945. When this thing was created, ladies and gentlemen, they set this up against them, that they cannot be belligerent. They are the foreigners. They are the ones that are attacking the inhabitants. That's us. This puts a whole new twist into a lot of this information of what we thought and what we understood. Once you start understanding this side of this thing, and you start reading it, and take your time, and read it several different times, you're going to have a whole new light. Like I said, we are in the military jurisdiction. The problem of it is, right now, the military can't come in. They can't do anything because we are ignorant on this fact because we never understood the rules of procedures on how they are to deal with us. We never understood this. We never understood their protocol. Oh, this, this explains all of us as prisoners of war and parole. Uh, when they put you into prison, you're not paying your captor. You're paying the government who is uh, the person who's uh, paroling you. This whole thing, everything, once you see this, you will see exactly what they've done to you. I mean, when it refers to parole, it's referring to you, you, but it's referring to all the bad things that you're going to see in this. It's how they have held you accountable as being the bad guy, when in fact it's a mirror image that is reflecting them and their behavior. You know, even, even this alleged assassination of uh, bin Laden just the other day on the 
section nine of this even incorporates assassination. It's, it's like one of the very last things on here. So even the rules of engagement on the assassination, which is our military, they did not even comply with the letter of the law there either. So they're, they're expecting us to go by the rules of engagement when they have violated every single rules of engagement. There's 157 of them here that they have broken every single one of them. So they can't hold us accountable when they are the ones that are the criminals, aside from not paying off the debt. When you read this, you'll get this. But like you said, read it more than once. You're going to be pissed off halfway through. So you'll need to read it a couple times so that you can cool off and really see what it really says and how they've made you the bad guy when they're the bad guy. Because they're not what, Rod? They're not following military protocol on any of this. Right. Right. But they're saying that, that, that you're committing an insurrection or rebellion or all of these nasty things because you're not behaving the way that they want you to be. Insurrection is the rising of people in arms against their government or portion of it. They are against one or more of its laws or against an officer or officers of the government. It may be confined to mere armed resistance or may have greater ends in view. Now, that's the government, okay? They're government. They're making it sound like everything that everybody in this country is doing is illegal. No, because they are not acting within the laws of, uh, like, what is, how are you saying it, Rod? They're not they're, acting within the military protocols of how they're supposed to be operating. Right. So they can't – it says right here that if they, if they break this, it's voidable. If they violate any of this, it's voidable. So they can't hold us accountable if they're not acting under military protocol because we're under military law. And the fact that that flag is flying in that courtroom – is absolute proof of it because that is under the state of emergency section of this. And if you go back and read Title 50, Section 23, jurisdiction of the court, they're busting you for disturbing the peace. They're busting us basically for being belligerent. And the thing of it is we're not being belligerent because if you go back and read Title 50 under the appendix, Section 21 of expatriation, this falls back under the Confiscation Act. As long as we did not expatriate, as long as we did not become combatant, they cannot drag us in. They're forcing us to follow one set of laws, knowing that they're operating under another set, and they're busting us for being belligerent, they're busting us for not following the regulations, but they have changed it. And once you go in and read this labor code, and you start understanding this, and you start realizing these people are in very, very serious trouble, if we can get this thing down pat with what we're doing, and if I can get the connections with the military to step in and we can show where they are in violation of the Labor Code, we can show where they're in violation of the Confiscation Act, bring this thing back under the Bankruptcy Clause, under the State of Emergency Clause on this, there may be an avenue here. But the reality of it is right now we have not got ourselves to the place to where we're willing to understand this because it's too much to believe and it, it sounds so fantastic but once you go back and start reading this information and you start digesting it you're going to see a whole different animal and a whole new different light of what we're dealing with and right now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry. I am the only one that's teaching this on this show. With what we're doing on this show with the researchers, with Jeanette and some of the other researchers I have and Carl, ladies and gentlemen, we are the only ones out here at this point in time 
of researching and giving this information, and we had close to 230 people on the call here. It went down like about 219 right now because it's getting late. But the problem of it is we've we got to get the word out. We have got to get the word out of what we're doing. We've got to start standing up in these courts and start doing and start explaining and start standing our ground in these courts. We don't have a choice. You're oh, you gonna love this one, Rod. Are you there? Freedom's on the line. Yes, it is. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, here's number 39. Y'all are going to love this one. The salaries of civil officers of the hostile government who remain in the invaded territory and continue the work of their office and can continue it according to the circumstances arising out of the war, such as judges, administrative or political officers, officers of city or command governments, are paid from the public revenue of the invaded territory until the military government has reason wholly or partially to discontinue it. Salaries or incomes connected with purely honorary titles are always stopped. Oops. The moment they sit here and change the republic to a democracy, they now became the hostile government. The moment they sat down and created the corporation, this now became the hostile government. These are the ones that took over. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot here to understand. There's a lot here to read. Just remember that next time you call a judge, your honor, because that just applies on that part right there. That's why you, you address him as sir. Sir or, or, or yeah, yeah. mister, call him, just call him mister, whatever his name is. Don't be disrespectful, but when he asks you why are you addressing him as that, then you have a good explanation because you're, you're obliged to address him as such. They, they cannot have a title of nobility. Not only that, because when you're in the military, it's yes, sir, no, sir. That's correct. And because he's sitting on the bench, it is sir. He doesn't have his rank showing, so you can't address him as captain or admiral or lieutenant commander or major. It is sir. And this is why they won't let you bring in the Constitution in the court, because it's under military law. That's exactly right. And, and the Constitution does not apply in the military court. And don't sit here and tell you that. They, they, they know they're caught now. These judges, they, they better pack their books, and they better, you know, take a permanent fishing trip and not even come back to the bench because they are caught. It's just that we've got, I've got to get you people to understand this and get it in your brain of, of what we're dealing with for you to comprehend it. And ladies and gentlemen, this is where the seminar and stuff that we're doing, and we're trying to get the seminars up, this is where this information is going to be more important with what we're doing. And one more thing on, on another note. Since we've all exposed the courts and the court administrators on the QSIP and the CRIS accounts, the Committee on Uniform Securities Identification Procedures, and the Court Registry Investment System, since they've all been caught on that and exposed on that, they're losing a lot of money by not being able to do those investments. So keep a real close eye on all of your utility bills. What we have found here in this whole neighborhood is everybody's bills are just getting jacked up because they're not making the revenue off of the Chris and the QSEP. So they're trading all of you on the Fidelity with all of your utilities. So what they're doing is they're increasing all of your utility bills to keep the tax revenue up, which goes right back in to this LIBER code. So keep an eye on your utilities and make sure that you're not getting overbilled, that they're, got, they're overcompensating for the loss on the QSIP and the CRIS account. That's it. All right. Uh, I got a caller. Harvey, I didn't realize I had you blocked out. Did you have something to say? No, no, no. I just wanted to be unblocked. That's all. Okay. I didn't realize. I had you try seeing. You're making my head spin. <laughs> I do that a lot. Mm. All right, Rhonda. Rhonda, go ahead. How are you doing? Uh, I had a couple things I wanted to say, but just listening to you and Jeanette talk about 
being under military in the courtroom. <clears throat> now I thought it kind of threw me because I thought I'd heard you say before that okay, we're under if we're under military in the courtroom, that brings them back to they have to provide the uh, government that was in place before they took over, which was the Constitution. Yeah, they got, brings them back in under Title Ten under three three three. They have to comply with federal and state statutes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and then, let's see. Oh, you was talking about uh, what part of the military to take it to. I heard a man say several years ago that they had went and talked to the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard had told them that uh, they can't do nothing as long as there's a civil government in place. And it seems to me with what you're doing, Rod, is, with what Carl likes to do is make a record that there's not a civil government in place. There's a belligerent government in place. Correct. And uh, Jeanette, last week when you was talking about uh, uh, trust, uh, good information you was bringing out on the trust there, and you said that the subject matter was the trust property. And I think you said, the tr and that was us the trust property right. and I have I have a little different take on that I agree with you the subject matter is the trust property however my take would be that the trust property is that piece of paper they send you with numbers on it because there is no money oh no what I read was right out of the Black's Law book when the judges are saying that they have subject matter the subject matter is the property of the trust with what right. they're, you have to look at it look at it from their viewpoint not yours their viewpoint is what they believe is that you are the property of the trust. Therefore, they have the subject matter because you're the property of the trust. Or could it be, or could it be that they sent you property of the trust, which was paper with numbers on it, and you still got it? Probably both. It's a hot potato. Yeah, probably both. So that's just what I wanted to bring up. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, we're not done by far. We still, as we grow, we're finding more information, and a lot of the information we've had is still intact. Because we brought up before about the Confiscation Act, we, didn't, we never brought up the Libra Code until I had a chance to sit down and do a little bit of talking because I've said on this information, I didn't know where it played at in here. After having a conversation with some people, I went back in and started looking at it, and I started making the connection between the confiscation, the Libra Code, the Reconstruction Act, the 14th Amendment, and the 1933 bankruptcy, and started looking at the, the bankruptcy side of this, the state of emergency side of this, the Trading with the Enemy Act side of this, Everything runs us back over to with that eight, 1967 congressional record that sit down and says we are under military law. Ron Paul keeps addressing the fact that we are bankrupt. And if we are bankrupt, and the fact that they keep reinstating the state of emergency every two years. Ladies and gentlemen, the signs are here in front of us. We're being told. They're dropping hints. We're not making the connections, and I'm starting to make the connections on this. We are in the right area with what we're doing. Military does have jurisdiction. The problem of it is, how do we get their attention? How do we get them involved in this? How, what do we need to do to go get them to step in? Well, Rob, here on the, the Libra Code, on number one, and it's section one, martial law, military jurisdiction, military necessity and retaliation, article number one, it says, and I just say article number one, it's just number one, a place, a district, a country occupied by an enemy stands in consequence of the occupation under the martial law of the invading or occupying army. Whether army, whether any proclamation declaring martial law or any public warning to the inhabitants 
has been issued or not. Martial law is the immediate and direct effect and consequent of occupation or conquest. Folks, what's that tell you? All right, but part of the problem that we're dealing with is how do we approach them, approach the military, how do we approach, let's say, for instance, uh, let's say the Navy, for instance. I. If the Navy is the proper avenue to go to, all right, here we are technically a civilian. We're now going to the military and ask the military, asking the Navy to sit down and say, okay, we know that you are the trustee of what we're dealing with. Say, for instance, we know you're the trustee. All right, how do we approach them to address this with them in, or, in order to open up a dialogue? This is part of the stuff that we got. I've got to go back in and do some research on because I know the military is in charge of this. They've always had been. The signs are around us. The writing's on the wall because if you stop and look at a police officer, he holds military rank from corporal up to captain up to commander, everything we're dealing with, fire department, they hold rank. We're dealing with a military environment. Whether we want to admit it or not, or realize it or not, we are dealing with a military environment. We've got to be able to sit down and show that we are the peaceful inhabitants and we are trying to address this as a peaceful means in order to bring the republic back in. Like I said, I think Rap, Tim, and these other people with what they were doing, I think their foundation was right. I think where they erred is where they appointed themselves to be the head honchos in this. I think that's where they erred in this because we're trading one dictator for another one. We're not giving the people the choice, the avenue to elect their own government because it was done for them. And this is exactly what these people did to us. They moved themselves in, they overthrew ours, and now they dictated how these things are going to be ran. And I've looked back at all the instances, and if you people sit back and think about what I'm telling you, you're going to have to sit down and say, you know what? That's exactly what they did do. They appointed their own people. They well, like when Rod, went, when Rod went to his court in D.C., he went in as a private attorney general and asked the judge to fix the problem. Well, that's, is, that's causing a problem. But the other ones were just shifting the power. That was in North Carolina. I told the judge to fix the problem. Yeah. I didn't sit down and say, I'm going to come in and do it. I told him, this is your job. You fix it. These were here before you because your administrative branch of government overstepped their bounds. You're judicial. Now you are under the guidelines as judicial, being a judicial review judge, under the administrative side to deal with the administrative agencies and under the Administrative Procedure Act and under Title 5, Section 551, under sanction, under Paragraph 10, and under the Attorney General's Manual, under the Administrative Procedure Act of 1947, when that book was created, under Section 4 of Rules of Rulemaking Decision, that rulemaking decision is not creating new law, ladies and gentlemen. That's not creating new law. That rulemaking decision was to bring the administration in compliance because their public policy was in violation of statutory law, public law, and trust law. The administration side of this, that rulemaking, is to bring things back into compliance. Their policy is in violation. Uh, Rod, 
Yeah. With all that you said, you know, uh, Hitler wrote Mein Kampf. In that, he told all the people what he was going to do. And he came back years later and did it. Obama has stated he's going to have a two million man civilian army. Okay. And you're talking about the invasion of the of of a foreign entity taking over our government, and that's what we've got. We've got TSA sitting in airports, now going to the the railroads, then going to the bus stations, and they're going to establish roadblocks in which they're going to physically search people with no prior legal reason to do so. And uh, I think with what you're talking here, that uh, if if you can get if we can get enough people trained and educated to understand what's going on, then we can get a possibly a, a, a case together or paperwork together to uh, do something about it because you're headed in the right direction. But if you watched the movie that just came out a little while ago called State of Play. It's got Russell Crowe in it, and the plot is about the private security fields all running in through one company, okay, including all the way up to the Coast Guard. Okay, so that's what you're talking about right there, is a conglomeration of actually falling into one pocket. So watch the movie State of Play. We call those training films. You might want to watch that. Instead of, in case this is too hard for you to see and read, sometimes watch a movie uh, so you can still learn, but it will show you some of the things that they're putting out there for you to also see, but you have to know how to interpret it. State of play. I got one more caller. Let me take, take them, and then we're going to go ahead and close out here because it's a little after 11, and I've got a long drive ahead of me tomorrow. Uh, Clayton Cherry, go ahead. Clayton? Cherry 38? Clayton, hit your star six. You probably muted yourself out. Clayton, one more time. Hello? Yes. Hey, how you doing? Good. Hey, um, <clears throat> you educate, uh, us on uh, foreclosures, right? Because I just got on. All right, say that again. I said, do you um, do you provide education in, uh, for foreclosures? Yeah, Carl does. Right now, Carl's not in here tonight. He was running late, and he's got family issues that he's dealing with, probably visiting. So normally, he's in here, and he deals with all the foreclosures. Okay. Um, is there a way that I could get a hold of him um, as far as email wise, or do you have a website? Uh yeah, if uh, I Harvey is, is Carl's email address up on the website? Uh, on the rodclassteam.com. That I don't know, but maybe maybe you should give it out or whatever if you want. Uh, I don't have it right up front with me. Okay, I thought... it's Justice. I have the I have his address. It's Justice. Oh nine five zero nine five seven at sbcglobal.net. So justice0957 at sbcglobal.net. He's okay. very busy, very busy. So it may take some time. Make your subject line compelling. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, he's, he's the man to talk to on foreclosures. You say he's the right one? Yep. Yes, sir, he is. Okay, so just so justice zero nine zero seven at SPC dot Zero nine five seven. So justice zero nine five seven at SBC Global dot. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and do closing prayer here tonight. Uh, Rudy, you mind giving us close prayer, honey? No problem. With our hearts and our minds free and clear, let us all pray to our Creator, from everlasting to everlasting, merciful, gracious, and heavenly Father. 
We come, Lord God, to the close of another call, and for this we say thank you. We thank you for the fellowship that we have experienced tonight. We thank you for the fellowship that is being taught. We thank you for our health and we thank you for our strength. We thank you for wisdom and for knowledge that is being imparted. Lord God, we thank you for our many blessings that only you have bestowed upon each and every one of us and all of those extended families to those persons on the call. Lord God, we ask for a very special blessing and continued anointing on all who are in leadership position for guidance and for dedicate their dedicated efforts as they lead us on this very special crusade of social justice. Lord God, I humbly submit this request to you, that with your finger of healing and your finger of mercy to touch each and every one of us who stands in need of anything. Let the words that we have heard be beneficial to all of us in a mighty special way. Lord, bring us through our trials and our tribulations and restore us many times over for whatever it is we stand to lose. I ask these blessings and all other blessings in the precious, the majestic, and the adorable name of our Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Thank you. Kirby, any, any last updates? Uh, no, not really, I don't think. Uh, no, good, very good call tonight, Rod. People should be listening to it over and over. Because I think you, I think you've got the dots pretty well, nicely lined up. Well, that's what I'm hoping, ladies and gentlemen. Because like I'm, I'm telling you, we got them on the administrative side. We have them on the judicial side. Now we're pulling them in on the military side of this. Because now we're exposing their military p- protocol violations. That's what's going to hurt them, Rod. I mean, it's bad enough that they did the administrative violations. But bringing us in under military law when they're not complying through the rules of engagement and military protocol themselves, they've got some explaining to do now, don't they? Ladies and gentlemen, do the research. Get in. Read this stuff, ladies and gentlemen, because without you, we can't fix the problem. It takes us to fix it. Not me, us. We. We the people. We, the Republic, we have to fix this thing. But, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to get educated. But we've got to have the right knowledge. And that's why I want you people to go back and read the paperwork, because once you read it, then you will sit back and say, okay, this is far-fetched, or, my God, we didn't realize this, because we're actually sitting here seeing it. So, ladies and gentlemen, take the time. Research. Look it up. Read it for yourself. Because the reality of it is, the more we know about their job, the better we can come in and tell them what their job is. This is why the judge, when he asked me about my declaratory judgment, if he was to do one, what would he want? When I told him, let's go to the Attorney General's manual, he realized what I did to him. Because he knew that I knew protocol. He knew that I knew the rules. This judge has a very serious, serious problem on his hands. Because the reality of it is, if he doesn't fix the problem, he's part of the problem. And if we do get the backing and support, and we can find somebody that will step in, Judge Manning, under the labor code, could be facing a lead ball because that's exactly what the Libra Code sits here and says. If you get caught pillaging, plundering, looting, you use your position and you do this to peaceful inhabitants, there's a, there is only one penalty. And ladies and gentlemen, there is no trial. There is no taking this to court to find him guilty. The military automatically comes in. Under the Lieber Code, if you go back and read it, there's only one penalty getting caught red-handed. These judges have been doing it too long. We're starting to run into this. And we're starting to open up this door. So, ladies and gentlemen, take advantage of it. Read it. Understand it. And we'll catch you next.